Hey guys, how's it going? It's James, and in today's video I am going to be doing my August wrap-up. Now, I've never done a wrap-up before. I'm used to making full-fledged reviews, so I, I wonder how brief I'll be able to keep my thoughts on these books. Um, I think it will be easier than usual because I actually don't have a lot of these books in my possession anymore. I gave them back to the library, so I can't really double-check certain uh, details or talk about specific scenes because I generally don't take notes when I read, and I probably should from now on, but uh, we'll see how this goes. So this will be split into two parts because I read 13 books in August, and I figured that you know, me talking about 13 books in a row would get a bit fatiguing, so I thought I'd split it into two, roughly half, so six in one video, seven in the other. Um, so I guess I'll just get straight on into it. So the first book I read in the month of August was Ghost Wall by Sarah Moss, and this was my first Sarah Moss, I was going to say novel, it's more of a novella, it's really small. So this book follows a girl called Sylvie, and her father is a bus driver but also a bit of an amateur archaeologist. He has a particular interest in English archaeology surrounding the Iron Age, and I think before that, I can't remember the exact details, but he is in contact with various academics. And one particular academic from the south of the country uh, it has decided to bring a few students up to the north of England to replicate how life was lived back in those times, or rather a better word would be reenact. And Sylvie's father takes Sylvie and her mother on this trip. Let's just say things don't go well for Sylvie. Sylvie's father is abusive, and in the context of, you know, the English Moors, it's, it's, it's a bit wild. And of course they are living, um, trying to replicate how life was lived back then. Um, it seems to provide the perfect context for Sylvie's dad to exact uh, kind of harsh punishments on his daughter, usually involving violence, and uh, he also beats his wife as well. On the surface, this book seems to, to play with ideas of domestic violence and, and um, the patriarchy, but I think it goes a lot deeper than that. And of course, violence does come into it. But I think what Sarah Moss is really trying to say with this book is that in the current day, we look at how far we've come as a civilization and we congratulate ourselves. We pat ourselves on the back because we've come so far from those those wild and, and feral days of, of old. The thing is, we still experience the same primal instincts uh, that the people in the Iron Age experienced. There is still a lust for power. The only difference is that the structures that we engage with in the modern world are slightly different. And well, they're quite different. <laughs> but um, I think this book is more about power and how we seek power in ways that will give us some sort of validation. So for Sylvie's father, he is searching for uh, I guess, evidence for a purely English ethnicity. Um, he is interested in archaeology because he believes it's his heritage. He believes that this is his land. Um, and we see throughout the book that this isn't actually the case, and English England has been a land of many different cultures, different civilizations, and it's not really the point to kind of point a finger and say these group of people were the original inhabitants of this land. This is particularly pertinent in the era of Brexit because, um, you know, that there's this whole notion of people reclaiming their country. So that's what the book was trying to get at. And I think it did a really good job of exploring these themes. Uh, Sarah Moss's writing is great. She's definitely an author that I will be uh, looking into in the future. I can't help but feel though that the ending of the book was a little anticlimactic for me. It's, in a sense, I'm glad it ended the way it did because if it had gone the other way, I would be very unhappy. <laughs> um, not because it wasn't good, just because it would have been terrible in relation to Sylvie. But I would definitely recommend this book. It's really short. I read it in a day. Uh, so started off the month well, I think. So the next book I have to talk about is actually the only one I've got in physical form, and that is 
My Sister the Serial Killer by Oyinkan Braithwaite. So this book follows uh, a woman called, uh, let me see if I can get this name right, Korede, I think, and her sister Ayula. And Ayula is the sister the serial killer character in this book. The book opens uh, after Ayula has just killed her third boyfriend, which technically makes her a serial killer. And Korede is kind of roped into these antics, um, I guess out of protection for her sister. Uh, and she comes in to clear up the mess that her sister creates. And this is a common theme in the book uh, in different ways. Um, Ayula is a little bit unaware of the world around her. She is a little bit narcissistic. Korede is quite the opposite. Korede is more sensitive and, I guess, more sensible. And we see how their relationship is affected when Ayula starts to date Korede's love interest, who is a doctor at her workplace, so Korede is a nurse. I thought this book was really entertaining. It's also a really short one. Um, again, I read this, uh, I actually read this in the same day as Ghost Wall, so it shows you how short they are. And I have to say, I really enjoyed uh, the explorations of sisterhood and the dynamics between Korede and Ayula. While I don't think the writing was anything to write home about, I don't think the book was really, really aiming for that. Um, it wasn't attempting to be grandiose. It was attempting to be entertaining and I guess down to earth, while also, uh, I guess, kind of looking at sisterhood in a different way. And I think it was really successful at that. Is it a book that I would recommend to everybody? No, but it definitely is a book that I would recommend to certain people. The next book I read was Freshwater by Akwaeke Emezi. Akwaeke Emezi is a Nigerian author who has kind of entered the literary scene right relatively recently. Freshwater was their debut. And I thought it was quite a strong debut in all honesty. I Obviously it does kind of have the tropes that you would find in a debut novel. There's a lot of autobiographical content. I think that there's a lot that is done in the book. Whether or not certain things needed to be focused on as much is up to debate. Um, but I thought it had a really strong sense of purpose. It's, it's a little bit difficult to describe the, the, what happens in the book without giving things away. But essentially it's about a girl called Ada, and Ada is born as a host to multiple spirits. Now this isn't usually what's meant to happen, usually it's only meant to be one spirit, I'm fairly certain. But basically these spirits get trapped inside Ada. They, they get through the gates, but they can't really get back out through the gates. And um, this is because Ada's parents uh, prayed that she would, um, I guess, be blessed by Allah, not A-L-L-A-H, but A-L-A, who is basically this um, queen of the gods kind of figure in Ig Igbo cosmology. It's basically following her life as she grows up and is manipulated by the spirits that lie within. And as she grows up, the spirits within her change, they recombine, they perform new personas. They take her on quite a self-destructive path, a, bit, a path of hedonism um, that is actually injurious to her own well-being. It is an interesting coming-of-age novel that has a, has a strange twist, and this book can really venture into some dark places. Uh, there are scenes involving self-harm, um, there's suicidal thoughts, and the whole time you never feel that this is gratuitous. It, it's, it feels very authentic. And I think that's what makes the novel all the more harrowing. Um, but at the end of the novel, you do end up with some sort of solace, which is gratifying, I think, as, as a reader, especially because you know that there are some autobiographical elements in this story. Overall, quite a strong novel. I do think, again, there are some issues relating to the fact that it is a first novel. I think that sometimes the writing gets a bit carried away with itself. Uh, one line in particular that stuck out to me was, I sleep like swollen opium, which just made me go, what is going on? Um, I had no clue what the author was trying to get at, but other times the writing was really beautiful, lyrical. I have a feeling that Akwaike Emezi is a poet in their spare time. There were some things, again, some allusions that I don't really think I grasped because I'm not well acquainted with Igbo cosmology. Uh, I think that if you are Nigerian, you'll get more out of this novel than I did. Uh, but nonetheless, it's a novel that I really respect and I was 
very happy to have read it. So I will definitely be keeping my eye on this author in the future. The next book I read is one that I've talked about already, and I mentioned it in my Booker shortlist reaction video. And the book is An Orchestra of Minorities by Jagosier Obioma. Um, so it's my third, it was my third Nigerian novel in a row. And it was really interesting to see how the three Nigerian novels that I read kind of informed one another, because I think My Sister the Serial Killer was actually the first novel by a Nigerian author that I had read. So I was kind of shown this new world, this new setting, this new culture. And it was cool to see how each of these books showed me a different side of Nigeria. And um, in particular with the last couple of books, uh, Freshwater and an Orchestra of Minorities, the Igbo uh, cosmology side of things. That being said, I didn't really enjoy An Orchestra of Minorities at all. It was probably my most disappointing read of the month. Um, again, I've got more of my thoughts on it in the Booker shortlist reaction video, but it, basically it's about a poultry farmer called Chinonso, and one night he's driving along a highway, he comes to a bridge, and a woman is going to jump off and commit suicide. And in order to prevent her from committing this act, he throws off two of his own chickens to demonstrate to her what would happen when she fell off. And a few months pass by and they reconnect. Um, I can't remember how, but they reconnect and they basically fall in love. Uh, the woman's name is Indali. And Indali comes from a, an affluent family. Her, her father, I think, is a, a chief of a tribe. They're all educated. Chinonso is not. And the conflicts get to the point where Chinonso actually makes a drastic decision to go and educate himself, uh, and he goes upon the recommendation of a friend to Cyprus. And things don't go to plan, basically, and that's all I will say about the plot. The book really overstayed its welcome, unfortunately. I think by page 300 I was wanting the book to wrap up, and there was still another 230 pages or so. I think one of the things that brought the novel down for me was the narrator. The narrator is a chi or a ki, which is a spirit that dwells within everyone. Everyone has their own chi, and the chi is able to subtly guide the host in particular directions, but isn't actually able to do anything directly. And so the chi is having to relay what has happened to Chinonso to, I guess, this higher court system, uh, to, for lack of a better term, in um, the Igbo cosmological world. And it was actually the narrative voice that really got to me. I found that this is where the writing became the most amateur and a, a little bit trite as well. So uh, in saying that, though, I did enjoy the Cyprus section for the most part. Again, I thought pacing could have been better. Um, but I thought that was the best part of the book, and it's the reason why I didn't outright hate the book or put it down. Um, so at the very least there was that, but overall I just found it a bit disappointing. The next book I read was Happy by Nicola Barker, and this book was quite a change of pace for me because I had never read Nicola Barker before, and um, boy, it was quite the experience. I really enjoyed Happy. And I know that Nicola Barker isn't everyone's cup of tea. I, I also know that Happy isn't everyone's favorite book in the world. Um, but I thought it was quite a, a strong concept-driven piece of fiction. And it's basically about this utopian slash dystopian, depending on the way you look at it, future, where uh, everyone is living under what is known as the system. And the system is this amorphous concept that governs everyone's lives. Um, everyone needs to think for the system, work for the system. No one is allowed to create their own narrative. No one is allowed a, a sense of individuality that comes from within. Everything has to be based around what is okay and acceptable for the system. So for instance, you're not allowed to use certain language. You're not allowed to think certain thoughts. You're not allowed to get information and try to create a narrative out of it. And all of this is monitored by the censor, which is, again, something that isn't really defined, but often uh, you can override the censor by looking directly into a strong light. And that's the only way people are able to kind of shake themselves free from the constraints of the system. This is shown through the text by different colored writing. So when particular words are used, you might it might be in red, it might be in purple, depending on the I guess the meaning within the context, the severity of the word. I found that often when words were quite 
strong, they um, were given a red or a purple color, again, depending on the context. And there were also other interesting typographical tricks like large font, overlaid font, um, things can get really, really crazy. And the book follows a musician called Myra A, who is um, basically a bit of a, a bit of a deviant in this system. Myra A really wants to create her own story, which of course is completely against what the system stands for. And I won't spoil any more than that, but it's really interesting how Barker represents Myra A's decline typographically. So I think this book is much more than uh, a simple reading experience. It's really a visual experience as well. One thing that really struck me with this novel is that the system is, I guess, replacing God. The young don't need to think about God or have faith because the system is all that they need and the young are essentially their own gods. The thing with this though is that it's kind of ironically playing back into the notions of faith because the young don't know anything but the system and the system doesn't really seem to be a concrete thing. It's more of a concept, something that they blindly follow. And so it's almost like they are falling back into the trappings of blindly believing in religion. And um, I guess I don't really know if Nicola Bach was trying to comment on anything in the real world, but I, I thought it was a an interesting kind of cyclic reasoning there that was uh, forming the foundation of a whole society. Anyway, really enjoyed it. The next book is one that I talked about in my book of shortlist reaction, and that is 10 minutes, 38 seconds in this strange world by Elif Shafak. And again, this one I had mixed feelings on. I didn't dislike the book. So this book is split into three parts and only the first part is the 10 minutes, 38 seconds aspect of the book, uh, where we see a sex worker called Tequila Layla who is being killed. And as her brain is shutting down, she is reliving memories um, from her life, kind of showing how she got to the point where she was living and working in Istanbul as a sex worker. While this part impressed me overall, I thought it was very strong, I couldn't help but wish that Elif Shafak had done something a bit closer in, in character to what William Faulkner did in The Sound and the Fury with Benji's chapter, because I feel that if your brain is you know, throwing all these memories at you, it wouldn't be as cohesive as the the book Elif Shafak wrote was. At least she didn't present the memories in a linear fashion. She They jumped around. I was okay with it, but there was this indulgent part of me that would have liked a little bit more an experimental side to things. But then I think the contrast between the first part and the second part and third part would be even more jarring than it already was. And my problem with the second and third part was that I felt that it got way too sentimental. I felt that the tone really changed and we got a cast of characters that often weren't really well developed to kind of follow for the rest of the novel. So for me anyway, I ended up not really enjoying my time with the book as it ended, but I have to admit that the first part was very good and it's actually the selling point of the novel. So a bit mixed on it, but you know, it was interesting. You know, and, and I'm glad that I read it. Thank you so much for watching part one of my August wrap up. If you have read any of these books, please feel free to let me know what you thought about them in the comments below, and I will see you for part two. Bye.